Chapter Thirty Six of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Six. Little Rifts. One bright morning in May, not long after the return from the continent, Mabel was sitting in her own room at the back of the small house which had been taken on Camden Hill. She was writing at a table by the raised window when the door opened suddenly and Mark burst in in a state of suppressed but very evident excitement. "'I have brought you something,' he said, and threw down three peacock-blue volumes upon her open blotting-case. The title, Sweet Bells Jangled, ran in sprawling silver letters from corner to corner of the covers. Through a medley of cracked bells and withered hyacinths in dull gold, the general effect being more bold than pleasing. Mabel was just about to exclaim sympathetically, what a frightful binding they've given you dear when mark informed her with some complacency that it was his own design nowadays you see he explained you want something to catch the eye or you won't be read inwardly mabel could not help wondering that he could condescend to such a device or think it necessary in his own case look at the fly-leaf he said and she opened the first volume and read the printed dedication to my wife i thought that must bring me luck he said and now darling do you know what you are going to do you are going to put away all those confounded letters and sit down here and read the opening chapters carefully and tell me what you think of them for till then he had made continual excuses for not showing her any portion of his new work either in manuscript or proof from mixed motives of vanity and diffidence mabel laughed with an affectionate pride at his anxiety this is what comes of marrying a great author she said go away and let me begin at once and tell you at lunch how i enjoyed it no said mark despotically i'm going to stay here or you might try to skip but i can't allow that she protested suppose i find i'm obliged to skip suppose it's a terrible disappointment no you ridiculous mark i didn't mean it stay if you like i'm not afraid of being disappointed though i really would enjoy it best in solitude mark insisted he felt that at last he was about to be reinstated in his own opinion he could wait no longer for the assurance of triumph when he saw with his own eyes the effect of his genius upon mabel when he read the startled delight and growing admiration in her face then at last he would know that he was not actually an impostor there are many methods of self-torture but perhaps few more ingenious and protracted than submitting the result of one's brain work to a person whose good opinion we covet and watching the effect mark imposed it on himself nevertheless chiefly because in his heart he had very little fear of the result he took a rocking chair and sat down opposite mabel trying to read the paper by and by as she read on in silence his heart began to beat and he rocked himself nervously while his eyes kept wandering from the columns to the pretty hands supporting the volume which hid mabel's face hands reveal many things and mabel's could be expressive enough at times but they told him nothing then he watched them turn a leaf from time to time they always did so deliberately almost caressingly he thought but with no eagerness although the opening was full of incident he calculated that she must be at a place where there was a brilliant piece of humorous description she had a fair share of humour why didn't she laugh have you got to that first appearance of the curate on the tennis ground he asked at last she laid down the volume for an instant and he saw her eyes they were calm and critical past that i am beginning chapter three she said the second chapter had contained some of his most sparkling and rollicking writing and it had not even moved her to smile he consoled himself with the reflection that the robuster humour never does appeal to women he had begun his third chapter with a ludicrous anecdote which though it bordered on the profane he had considered too good to be lost but now he had misgivings i'm afraid he ventured dubiously you won't like that bit about the bishop darling i'm afraid i don't quite she replied from behind the book 
the story had no real harm in it even in mabel's eyes the only pity was that in any part of illusion it would have been an obvious blot and that it did not seem out of keeping in the pages she was reading now she had sat down to read with such high hopes so sure an anticipation of real enjoyment that it was hard to find that the spell was broken she tried to believe that she read on because she was interested her real reason was a dread of some pause when she would be asked to give her opinion what should she say perhaps it should be explained at once that the book was not a foolish one mark whatever else he was could scarcely be called a fool and he had a certain share of the literary faculty it was full of smart and florid passages that had evidently been industriously polished and had something of the perishable brilliancy of varnish there is a kind of vulgarity of mind so subtle as to resist every test but ink and the cheap and flashy element in mark's nature had formed a deposit slight perhaps but perceptible in more than one page of sweet bells jangled mabel felt her heart grow heavier as she read why had he chosen to deliberately lower his level like this where were the strong and masterly touch the tenderness and the dignity of his first book that had faults too even faults of taste but here the faults had almost overgrown the taste surely if she read on she would find the style attain the old distinction and the tone grow noble and tender once again but she read on and the style was always the same and the tone if anything rather worse mark had long since moved to a spot where he could command her face her fine eyebrows were slightly drawn her long lashes lowered and her mouth compressed as if with pain somehow the sight did not encourage him she was becoming conscious that her expression was being closely watched which seldom adds a charm to reading and at last she could persevere no longer and shut the book with a faint sigh well said mark desperately he felt as if his fate hung on her answer i i have read so little yet she said let me tell you what i think at the end tell me what you think of it so far said mark must i she said almost imploringly yes said mark with a grating attempt at a laugh put me out of my misery she loved him too well to make some flattering or evasive reply she was jealous for his reputation and could not see him peril it without a protest oh mark she cried locking her hands and pressing them tight together you must feel yourself it is not your best you have done such great work you will again i know dear but this it is not worthy of you it is not worthy of illusion he knew too well that it was his best that it was not in him to do better if the world's verdict agreed with hers he was a failure indeed he had been persuading himself that after all he was not a common impostor that he had genius of his own which would be acknowledged far above his friend's talent now all at once the conviction began to crumble he turned upon her with a white face and a look of anger and mortification in his eyes the first is always the best of course he said bitterly that is the regulation verdict if sweet bells had come out first and illusion second you would have seen this sad falling off in the second book i did not think you would be the first to take up that silly old cry mabel i thought i could always come to my wife for encouragement and appreciation it seems i was mistaken mabel bit her lip and her eyes were dazzled for a moment you asked me what i thought she said in a low voice do you think it was pleasant to tell you when you ask me again i shall know better how you expect to be answered he felt all at once what he had done and hastened to show his penitence she forgave and did not let him see how deeply she had been wounded only from that day some of the poetry of her life had turned to prose of sweet bells jangled she never spoke again and he did not know whether she ever read it to the end or not they had finished breakfast one saturday morning and mark was leisurely cutting the weekly reviews when he suddenly sheltered himself behind the paper he had been skimming 
Sweet Bells was honoured with a long notice. His head swam as he took in the effect with some effort. The critic was not one of those fallen angels of literature who rejoice over an unexpected recruit. He wrote with a kindly recollection of illusion, and his condemnation was sincerely reluctant. Still, it was unmixed condemnation, and ended with an exhortation to the author to return to the higher and more artistic aims of his first work. Mark's hand shook till the paper rustled when he came to that. He was so long silent that Mabel looked up from reading her letters, and asked if the new book was reviewed yet. "'Reviewed yet?' said Mark, from behind the article. "'Why, it hasn't been out a fortnight.' "'I know,' said Mabel. "'But I thought perhaps that, after illusion—' "'Every book has to wait its turn,' said Mark, as he saved himself with all the reviews, and locked himself in the little study— where he sketched out the stories to which he had not as yet found appropriate endings. There was another notice amongst the reviews, but in that the critic was relentless in pointing out that the Wylam Idol had feet of clay, and enormous ones. After a very severe elaboration of the faults, the critic concluded, it almost seems as though the author, weary of the laudation which accompanied the considerable, if in some degree accidental, success of his first book, had taken this very effectual method of rebuking the enthusiasm. However this may be, one more such grotesque and ill-considered production as that under review, and we can promise him an instant cessation of all the inconveniences of popularity. Mark crumpled up the paper and pitched it to the other end of the room in a fury. It was a conspiracy. They were writing him down. Oh, the malice and cowardice of it! He destroyed both reviews lest Mabel should see her opinion confirmed, and her faith in him should be shaken. However, sundry copies of the reviews in question were forwarded to him by good-natured people who thought it might amuse him to see them, and one was even sent to Mabel with red chalk crosses in thoughtful indication of the more unpleasant passages. She saw the date and remembered it as the day on which Mark had fenced himself in at breakfast. She came in with the paper as he sat in the study, and, putting one hand on his shoulder, bent over him with a loving reproach in her eyes. "'Someone has just sent me this,' she said. "'You have seen it, I know. Why didn't you trust me, dear? Why have you let this come from others? Never try to hide things from me again, Mark, not even for my good. And—and and after this, let us share everything, sorrow and all, together.' She kissed him once on the forehead, and left him there to his own thoughts. Why, thought Mabel, was he not strong enough to disregard criticism, if he was satisfied with his own work, as he evidently was? She hated to think of his having tried to keep their notices from her in that weak, almost underhand way. She knew that the motive was not consideration for her feelings, and had to admit sadly that her hero was painfully human after all. Still, illusion had revealed a nature the nobility of which no weakness could obscure, and if his daily life did not quite bear out such indications, he was Mark Ashburn, and she loved him. Nothing could alter that. Some weeks later Vincent returned from Italy, and one of the first persons he met was Harold Caffin. It was in the city where Vincent had had business, and he attempted at first to pass the other by, with the curtis possible recognition. He had never understood his conduct in the Wastwater episode, and still resented it, but Caffin would not allow himself to be cut, and his greeting was blandly affectionate as he accused his friend of abandoning him in the Lake District. He was determined, if he could, to convince Holroyd that his silence as to Mabel's impending marriage had been due solely to the consideration of his feelings, and then, when confidence was restored, he could sound him upon the result of his journey to Laufingen. But Vincent, from a vague feeling of distrust, was on his guard. Caffin got nothing out of him, even by the most ingenious pumping. He gathered that he had met Mark at Laufingen, but with all his efforts he was not able to discover if that meeting had really been by accident or design. He spoke casually of illusion, but Vincent showed no particular emotion. "'I suppose you don't know,' he added, "'that Mrs. Featherstone has done it the honour of making a play of it. "'It's going to be done at the end of the season at their house, 
before a select party of distinguished sufferers. Holroyd had not heard that. "'I've been let in for it,' Caffin continued. "'I'm playing that stick of a poet. Julian, the beggar's name is. It's my last appearance on the boards till I come out as Benedict. But that won't interest you, and it's a sort of secret at present. Vincent was not curious, and asked no questions. Who do you think is to be the Beaumel, though? said Caffin. The author's own wife. Romantic, that, eh? She's not half bad at rehearsals. You must come and see us, my boy. Perhaps I shall, said Vincent mechanically, and left him, as much at fault as ever, but resolved to have patience still. Caffin's was a nature that liked tortuous ways for their own sake. He had kept his suspicions to himself hitherto. He was averse to taking any direct action until he was quite sure of his ground. He had those papers in Holroyd's writing. It was true, but he had begun to feel that they were not evidence enough to act on. If by some extraordinary chance they were quite compatible with Mark's innocence, then if he brought a charge against him, or if any slanderous insinuations were traced to him, he would be placed in an extremely awkward and invidious position. If I'm right, he thought, Master Vincent's playing some deep game of his own. It may be mine, for all I know. At all events, I'll lie low till I can find out where the cards are, and whether an ace or two has got up my sleeve. Vincent had been able to speak with perfect calmness of his lost book, because he had almost brought himself to a philosophic indifference regarding it, the more easily as he had had consoling indications lately that his creative power had not been exhausted with that one effort, and that with returning health he might yet do good work in the world. But now, as he walked on after leaving Caffin, this indifference suddenly vanished. His heart beat with a secret and exquisite bliss at the thought of this play in which Mabel was to represent his own heroine to hear that his work was to receive the rather moderate distinction which can be conferred by its dramatization on a private stage would scarcely have elated him under ordinary circumstances it was no longer any concern of his at all still he could not resist the subtle flattery in the knowledge that his conception was about to be realized in a manner for which few authors would dare to hope the woman who had inspired it would lend it all her own grace and beauty and tenderness to fill the faint outline he had traced with such loving pains. All the banality of private theatricals could not spoil that. She need not even act. She had only to be her own sweet self to give life and charm to the poorest play, and the most incompetent of performances. And then, as he thought of it, a wild longing came over him to be there and see her. There might be something grotesque, and under the circumstances, almost undignified in such a longing now but it possessed him nevertheless he would not betray himself or mark but this one gratification he hungered for and neither pride nor prudence had power to restrain him he had meant to see as little as possible of mabel on his return but he broke his resolution now he would not keep away he thought surely he could trust himself to bear the sight of her happiness it ought to reconcile him more fully to all he had endured to secure it. And then he would be able to find out from her if this, which he had heard from Caffin, was really true. And so, having procured the address from Mrs. Langton, he went on that same afternoon to Camden Hill, not knowing, nor indeed greatly caring, just then, that this was not the way to deaden the pain at his heart. End of chapter 36Chapter thirty seven of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty seven. Mark accepts a disagreeable duty. Vincent had his misgivings as he walked towards Camden Hill that at such a period of the London season his journey would most probably be a fruitless one. But as he approached the house, he found one or two carriages waiting outside, the horses troubling the hot afternoon stillness with the sharp clinking of harness as they tossed their impatient heads and by the time he had reached the gate the clatter of china and the sustained chorus of female voices coming through the open windows made it plain enough that mabel was at home 
in a sense that was only one degree less disappointing than what he had dreaded he was almost inclined to turn back or pass on for he was feeling ill and weak the heat had brought on a slight tendency to the faintness which still reminded him occasionally of his long prostration in ceylon and he had a nervous disinclination just then to meet a host of strangers the desire to see mabel again prevailed however and he went in the pretty double drawing-room was full of people and as every one seemed to be talking at once vincent's name was merely an unimportant contribution to the general hubbub he saw no one he knew he was almost the only man there and for a time found himself penned up in a corner reduced to wait patiently until mabel should discover him in a cool half-light which filtered through the lowered sun-blinds he followed her graceful figure with his eyes as often as it became visible through the crowd it was easy to see that she was happy her smile was as frank and gay as ever the knowledge of this should have consoled him he had expected it to do so and yet to tell the truth it was not without its bitterness mabel had been his ideal of women his fair and peerless queen and it pained him as it had pained unsuccessful lovers before to think that she could contentedly accept pinchbeck for gold it was inconsistent on his part since he had sacrificed much for the very object of concealing from her the baseness of mark's metal he forgot too the alchemy of love but one cannot be always consistent and this inconsistency of vincent's was of that involuntary and mental kind which is not translated into action she saw him at last and welcomed him with an eager impulsiveness for she knew now that she had been unjust to him at laufingen they talked for some minutes until vincent said at last i hear you are going to play beaumel oh yes said mabel isn't it presumption but mrs featherstone you've met her once or twice at our house you know mrs featherstone would not hear of my refusing mark i believe thinks the part hardly suited to me but i mean to try and astonish him and though i may not carry out his own idea i love beaumel in the book so much that i ought not to be quite a failure in the play no you will not fail said vincent and dared not say more on that point i i should very much like to see this play he said a little awkwardly could it be managed i will try said mabel i am sure mrs featherstone will give me a card for you if she can but i warn you vincent it's not a good play there's one strong scene in the third act and the rest is a long succession of tete-a-tete like a society punch and judy it will bore you i think not said vincent and you won't forget will you of course not she replied there is mrs featherstone coming in now i will ask her at once but mrs featherstone had an air of suppressed flurry and annoyance which was discouraging and gilda's handsome face was dark and a little defiant as she followed her mother into the room can you get away from all these people for two minutes said mrs featherstone after the first greetings i've something to tell you mabel took her through the rooms out upon a balcony overlooking the garden and screened from the sun by a canvas awning we shall be quiet here she said mrs featherstone did not speak for some moments at last she said oh my dear i don't know how to tell you i can't talk about it with ordinary patience yet only think our foolish self-willed gilda told us this morning that that mr caffin had proposed to her and she had accepted him after all the offers she has refused isn't it too shocking to think of and she won't listen to a word against him the silly child is perfectly infatuated what does mr featherstone say asked mabel to whom the news was scarcely a surprise my dear he knows very well it is all his fault and that if he hadn't taken the young man up in that ridiculous way all this would never have happened so of course he pretends not to see anything so very unsuitable about the affair but he doesn't like it really how can he gilda might have married into the peerage and now she is going to do this i'm almost afraid these theatricals have brought it on mabel was scarcely sorry she was fond of gilda and thought her far too good for harold it may come to nothing at all she said as the only form of consolation she could think of 
if i could hope so sighed the distressed mother but she is so headstrong still he is not in a position to marry at present unless robert is insane enough to advance him to one would you speak to her it would be so sweet of you if you only would that mabel felt obliged to decline so delicate a mission and excuse herself then as they re-entered the room she mentioned holroyd's petition mrs featherstone recollected him faintly and was rather flattered by his anxiety to see her play but then he was quite a nonentity and she was determined to have as brilliant and representative an audience as possible for the performance my dear she said i would if i could but it's quite out of the question my list is over full as it is and i haven't an idea where we shall put all the people who will come there's so much talk about it everywhere that we have had next to no refusals but if he's only anxious to see the play and doesn't mind not being seen at all he could get some idea of the treatment next friday if he cares to come to the dress rehearsal you know we arranged to run right through it for the first time we thought of a small impromptu dance after the rehearsals so if mr holroyd would like to come a little earlier i shall be charmed to see him so vincent was brought up to the lady who repeated the invitation to the rehearsal which he accepted as it practically gave him the opportunity he had desired meanwhile gilda had drawn mabel aside towards one of the windows well she said so you have been told the great news mabel admitted this and added something as nearly approaching to congratulation as her conscience allowed ah said gilda you're on mamma's side i am on no one's side said mabel provided he makes you happy which you think rather doubtful replied gilda with a jarring little laugh really mabel i do think you might resign him a little more gracefully i'm afraid i don't understand you said mabel proudly no said gilda you are very innocent dear i can't undertake to explain only i am not altogether blind i hope not said mabel and left her she was afraid that if she stayed she might be tempted to say what could do no possible good now mrs featherstone had gone with a gracious reminder to vincent of his promise to come to the rehearsal it was late in the afternoon and every one seemed suddenly alarmed at the idea of being the last to go the consequence being that the rooms were cleared in an astonishingly short time mabel stopped vincent as he too was preparing to take his leave you must stay till mark comes back vincent he has taken dolly to the academy really i believe to get away from all this you haven't seen dolly since you came back and she's staying with me for a few days you won't go away without seeing her vincent had been disappointed at not seeing her at the langtons the day before and waited willingly enough now it would be some comfort to know that the child had not forgotten him and would be glad to see him he had not long to wait a hansom drove up and the next minute dolly came into the room with all her old impetuosity i've come back mab she announced to prevent any mistake on that head we drove home all the way in a black cab with yellow wheels didn't you see it oh and in the academy there was a little girl with a dog just like frisk and i saw a lot of people i knew and don't you see someone you used to know said mabel breaking in on her stream of reminiscences have you forgotten me dolly said vincent coming forward out of the shade his voice was a little harsh from emotion the change in the child's face as she saw him was instantaneous and striking all the light died out of her face she flushed vividly and then turned deadly pale you knew vincent wasn't dead really dolly said mabel yes whispered dolly still shrinking from him however and is this all you have to say to me dolly said vincent who was cut to the heart by this reception nothing was the same not even the love of this child dolly had not been long in recovering from the effect of caffin's last act of terrorism for a day or two she had trembled but later when she heard of vincent as going away in italy she could feel safe from his anger and so in time forgot now it all revived again he had sprung suddenly from nowhere he was demanding what she had to say for herself what should she do 
she clung to mabel for protection don't you be cross too she cried promise me you won't and i'll tell you all about it you don't know harold said you didn't and i never meant to burn vincent's letter don't let him be angry vincent was naturally completely bewildered what is she talking about he asked helplessly i can guess said mabel come away with me dolly and you shall tell me all about it upstairs and as dolly was not unwilling to unburden herself this time they left vincent with mark who had just joined them mark was uncomfortable and silent for some time when they were alone but at last he said i suppose you have been told of the the theatricals i i couldn't very well help it you know i hope you don't mind mind said vincent why should i mind what is it to me now i thought that was finally settled at laufingen i felt i must explain it that's all said mark and and i've a great deal to bear just now holroyd life isn't all roses with me i assure you if you could remember that now and then you might think less hardly of me i will try vincent had said and was about to say more when mabel returned alone her eyes were brilliant with anger children can occasionally put the feats of the best constructed phonograph completely in the shade everything that Catherine had told her about that unfortunate burnt letter dolly had just reproduced with absolute fidelity i know what happened to your letter now vincent mabel said mark you never would see anything so very bad in the trick harold played dolly about that wretched stamp see if this doesn't alter your opinion and she told them the whole story as it has been already described except that the motives for so much chicanery were necessarily dark to her a little comparison of dates made it clear beyond a doubt that an envelope with the ceylon stamp had been burned just when vincent's letter should in the ordinary course have arrived and dolly says he told her himself it was your letter concluded mabel ah said vincent not that that proves it but i think this time he has spoken truth only why has he done all this why suppress my letter and turn dolly against me malice and spite i suppose said mabel he has some grudge against you probably but go up now vincent and comfort dolly you'll find her in my little writing-room quite broken-hearted at the idea that you should be angry with her vincent went up at once and was soon able to regain dolly's complete confidence when he had gone mabel said to mark harold has been here very often lately dear i tried to think better of him when i saw you wished it but i can't go on after this you see that yourself don't you mark was angry himself at what he had heard now he knew how harold had contrived to get rid of dolly that afternoon in south audley street it made him hot and ashamed to think that he had profited by such a device he certainly had from motives he did not care to analyse himself, persuaded Mabel to tolerate Caffin as a guest, but lately even Mark could no longer pretend that his visits were not far more frequent than welcome. Something of the old uneasiness in Caffin's presence had begun to return, though Mark did not know why. At times before his marriage he had had moments of panic or mistrust, but he always succeeded in forgetting the incidents which had aroused them, if Caffin suspected anything about illusion, he would have spoken long before, he told himself. After the interview with Holroyd at Laufingen, he had ceased to think about the matter. He was safe now. What harm could anyone's mere suspicion do to him? And yet, for all that, he was not sorry to free himself from further intrusions, of a visitor in whose glance he sometimes surprised a subtle mockery, almost as if his friend had actually detected his secret and was cynically enjoying the humour of the thing it was only imagination on his own part but it was not a pleasant fancy he's an infernal scoundrel he said with an indignation that was only very slightly exaggerated you are right darling you shall not have to see any more of him but can't he be punished mark asked mabel and her eyes shone mark coughed if this affair were brought to light some of its later stages might not appear entirely to his own credit i don't quite see what he could be punished for he said not for stealing a letter she asked it was no less rather difficult to bring home to him he said 
couldn't be done without a frightful amount of of scandal and unpleasantness no said mabel thoughtfully i suppose nothing can be done and yet poor gilda do you know she is actually engaged to him it's dreadful to think of that now at least he shall never come here again and mother must be told too when i take dolly back you will tell him mark when you meet him that he is not to call himself a friend of ours any longer you will make him understand that won't you can't you tell him yourself at one of the rehearsals asked mark i would rather you told him dear she said and there are no rehearsals till friday oh said mark very well darling i will of course i will he was already beginning to feel that the interview might not be altogether agreeable End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight harold caffyn makes a palpable hit as mabel had said she did not meet harold caffyn again until both were dining at mrs featherstone's on the evening of the first rehearsal to which vincent had been favoured with an invitation the instant he saw her he felt that some change had taken place in their relations that the toleration he had met with since her marriage had given place to the old suspicion and dislike it was an early and informal dinner the guests being a few of those who were to take part in the acting later on mrs featherstone had contrived that caffyn notwithstanding his position as accepted suitor should not sit next to gilda and on taking his place he found mabel on his other hand and his fiancee opposite as often as he could he tried to open a conversation with the former but she met him coldly and shortly and with each attempt he fell back baffled he might have persevered but for the consciousness that gilda's eyes were upon them for she had been growing very exacting since the engagement had been formally declared but just before the ladies rose he found an opportunity to say mabel mrs ashburn am i unfortunate enough to have displeased you lately displeased is not the right word she said you have done far more than that and am i not to be told my offence he said looking at her keenly not here she replied you can ask my husband if you like really he said you refer me to him then we must try and come to an understanding together i suppose when you have heard him she said there is one thing i shall have to say to you myself may i come and hear it later asked caffyn and mabel gave a little sign of assent as she left the table i shall send down for you when we're ready said mrs featherstone at the door will those who have any changes to make mind coming now it's so late and we must get in the way of being punctual one or two who were playing servants or character parts left the table immediately the others remained and harold whose dressing would not take him long found himself next to mark and rather apart from the men at the host's end of the table you're the very man i wanted to have a little talk with he began in an easy conversational manner your wife seems deucedly annoyed with me for some reason she says you can explain now just tell me quietly without any nonsense what's it all about eh now that mark had seen the other's conduct in its true light he was really indignant caffyn seemed more undesirable an associate than ever he would have been justified in taking a high standpoint from which to deal with him since whatever his own errors had been they would never be revealed now but somehow he adopted an almost conciliatory tone the fact is he replied with an embarrassed cough it's about that letter of holroyd's caffyn's face slightly changed the devil it is he said thought i'd heard the last of that long ago you're likely to hear a good deal more about it i'm afraid said mark it has only just come out that it was his and unopened you will find it awkward to contradict caffyn was silent for a time dolly must have spoken again 
what a fool he had been to trust a child a second time and yet he had had no choice well he said at last and what are you going to do about it mark's throat grew huskier it was odd for there was really no reason for being afraid of the man well i in short i may as well tell you plainly my wife thinks it is better we should not see any more of you in future there was a dangerous look in caffyn's eye which mark did not like at all oh well of course you mean to talk her out of that he said lightly was there a concealed menace in his tone if so mark thought he probably considered that his services connected with vincent's sudden return gave him a claim well he must disabuse him of that idea at once it would be of no use if i tried to talk her out of it but to be quite candid i i don't intend to do anything of the kind i know we've been friends and all that sort of thing and till i knew this i always said what i could for you but but this suppressing a letter is very different i can't feel the same myself for you after that it is better to tell you so distinctly and then there is poor little dolly she is my sister now it seems you have been frightening her a second time on whose account eh ashburn asked caffyn mark had expected this i'm sorry to say on mine he replied but if i had known do you suppose that for one moment i don't deny that as i told you at the time i was glad to see holroyd leave town just then but it was was not so important as all that still you did me a service and i'm sorry to have to do this but i can't help myself you will find others harder on you than i am does that mean that mrs langton has been told this precious story with all the latest improvements asked caffyn not yet said mark but she must know before long and as for yourself you consider me such an utterly irreclaimable baggard that you can't afford to be seen with me any longer pursued caffyn my dear fellow protested mark i don't want to judge you but as far as the conclusion goes i am afraid it comes to that perhaps it has not quite come to that yet said caffyn as he drew his chair closer to mark's and resting one arm on the back looked him full in the face with searching intensity are you sure you have the right to be so very exclusive if mark could have controlled his nerves then he might have been able to parry a thrust which had he only known it was something of an experiment as it was the unexpectedness of it took him off his guard just when he thought he was proof against all surprises the ghastly change in him told caffyn that he had struck the right chord after all and a diabolical joy lit his eyes as he leaned forward and touched his arm affectionately you infernal hypocrite he said very softly i know all about it do you hear about what gasped the miserable man and then with a flickering effort of defiance what do you mean he asked tell me what you are hinting at keep quiet said caffyn don't excite yourself they'll notice something presently if you look like that here are some fellows coming round with the coffee wait till they have gone and i'll tell you mark had to wait while one man brought him his cup with the milk and sugar and another followed with the coffee his hands shook and upset the cream as he tried to take up a lump of sugar i wouldn't take milk if i were you advised caffyn try a liqueur brandy a recommendation to which mark paid no attention it seemed an eternity till the men had gone all the time mark tried to believe this was one of the old dreams which had not visited him for so long or if he was really awake that caffyn must have got hold of something else not that he had had false alarms like this before and nothing had come of them caffyn seemed to have forgotten their recent conversation as he deliberately sipped his coffee and took a cigarette he offered mark one and it was declined what do you suspect me of having done demanded mark oh my dear fellow i don't suspect you replied caffyn i know you can't play the moralist with me 
you high-minded old paragon he spoke with a kind of savage jocularity i tell you i know that you got your fame and fortune and even that charming mabel of yours by a meaner trick than i who don't pretend to be particular should care to dirty my hands with i may have helped a child to burn a letter i don't remember that i ever stole a book i've been an ass in my time i dare say but not quite such an ass as to go about in a lion's skin mark sat there dumb and terror-stricken his buried secret had risen after all it was all over he could only say in his despair has holroyd told you caffyn knew all he wanted when he heard that we won't go into that he said it's quite enough for you that i know do you feel quite such a virtuous horror of continuing my acquaintance now couldn't you bring yourself to overlook my little shortcomings this time must you really close your respectable door on me mark only looked at him you fool said caffyn to give yourself airs with me i've done you more than one good turn i believe i rather liked you you did the thing so well that i'm hanged if i should have had the heart to show you up and now you will go and make an enemy of me is it quite prudent what do you want me to do asked mark with his hand shielding his eyes from the shaded candles near him now you're being sensible said caffyn we shall hit it off yet you've got some authority over your wife i suppose use it stop this cackle about the letter make her shut her mouth i can't afford to lose the entree to two houses like your father-in-law's and your own just now i can be discreet too it shall be mouth for mouth if you don't if you stand by and let your wife and her mother go about spreading this story until i daren't show my face anywhere why i shall take care to come to grief in good company mabel can smash me if you like to let her but if you do by blank it shall bring my sting out is it a bargain mark hesitated as they sat there he heard the sounds inside of arriving carriages and entering footsteps people were coming in for this rehearsal how he loathed the thought of it now how was he to go through with it we shall have to go presently said caffyn i am waiting for my answer yes or no no said mark i see no use in playing mouse to your cat do you think i don't know that it would come out sooner or later if not from you from him as to forcing my wife to receive you as a friend i'm not quite rascal enough for that yet do whatever you please it was despair more than anything that drove him to defiance for his knowledge of mabel showed him that the bargain proposed apart from its rascality was an impossible one well said caffyn with a shrug you leave me no choice so in the course of a day or two my friend look out for squally weather whether i sink or swim myself i shall see you go to the bottom mr featherstone who was getting slightly tired of the enthusiastic young amateurs at his end of the table here suggested an adjournment to the music-room you'll come and look on sir won't you said his son but the merchant shook his head i think i can hold on till the night itself bertie my boy with a cleverly fielded yawn i hear all about it from your mother you'll find me in the billiard-room if you want me you know mark rose from the table to which he had sat down with so light a heart black disgrace was before him the laufingen crisis had come again and this time nothing could save him he lingered behind the other men as they mounted the broad staircase and as he lingered was overtaken by vincent who had just left his hat and overcoat below and was about to go upstairs stop cried mark don't go up yet i want to speak to you come in here and he almost forced him into the library which was empty and where a lamp was burning so we're on a level after all are we he said savagely as he shut the door holroyd simply asked him what he meant you know said mark 
all that generosity at laufingen was a sham was it a blind it didn't suit you that i should give myself up of my own free will and so soon so you put me off my guard and now his voice was thick with passion as he spoke now you have set that villain that deed caffin on me chivalrous that isn't it i've fallen into good hands between you vincent was hardly less angry you think every one is like yourself he said if it is any comfort to you to believe that i can break my word and betray those who trusted it believe it it's not worth my while to set you right no one who saw his face could doubt that he at least was no traitor and mark felt lower than ever as he realized his mistake forgive me he stammered i see i ought to have known better i hardly know what i am saying or doing just now but caffyn has found out everything and and who could have told him if any one betrayed you it must have been yourself said vincent look here ashburn don't give it up like this keep your head man he can't really know this it must be all guesswork did he mention my name yes said mark well i must have it out with him then what does it matter what he says if we both contradict him i think i shall be able to manage him only for heaven's sake keep cool leave everything to me try to be your usual self where is the rehearsal going on let us go there at once you'll be wanted mark said no more just then he led the way to the music-room and then went himself to the part which was screened off as a green room the music-room was a long high gallery at one end of which the stage had been set up there was a small audience of a dozen or so who were mostly related to the performers and admitted only because it had not been found practicable to keep them out the rehearsal had just begun as vincent entered it was much like most rehearsals and would hardly lose its tediousness in description there were constant interruptions and repetitions and most of the characters wore the air of people who had been included to play a game they thought silly but who were resolved to maintain their self-respect as long as possible this appearance might be due to an artistic reserve of force in some cases in others to nervousness in nearly all to a limited knowledge of the lines they had to deliver and all these causes would certainly be removed on the night because the actors said so themselves still on that particular evening they prevented the play from being seen to the best advantage it was not a good play and as a dramatization of illusion was worse than the most sanguine of mrs featherstone's acquaintances could have foreseen and yet as vincent stood and looked on from the background he felt strangely stirred when mabel was on the stage she at least had too intense a sympathy with her part to be able to walk through it even at a rehearsal though it would have been absurd to exert her full powers under the circumstances but there were moments in the later scenes which even mrs featherstone had not been able to deprive of all power or pathos when mabel was carried away by the emotion she had to represent and the anguish in her face and low ringing tones went to vincent's heart as he thought how soon it might become a terrible reality he could scarcely bear to see her there simulating a sorrow which was nothing to that which might be coming upon her and from which all his devotion might not save her this time he was impatient to meet caffyn and find out what he knew and how he might be silenced but caffyn was on the stage continually in his capacity of stage manager and vincent was forced to wait until his opportunity should present itself it was a relief to him when the rehearsal after dragging on through three long acts came to a premature close owing to the lateness of the hour and a decided preference on the part of the younger members of the company for the dancing which had been promised later as a bribe and which they had no intention of sacrificing to a fourth act for art must not be too long with amateurs the room was being cleared accordingly when vincent saw his hostess coming with caffyn in his direction and heard her say well i will ask mr holroyd then if you wish it she seemed excited and annoyed and he thought caffyn's face bore an odd expression of triumph he waited for the question with a heavy anticipation 
"'Mr. Caffin tells me you're quite an authority,' began Mrs. Featherstone. She had not yet found herself able to mention him as Harold. "'You heard our little discussion about the close of that third act just now. "'Now do tell me, how did it strike you?' This appeal was an unexpected relief to him. He protested that he was not qualified to express any opinion. "'Now really,' said Caffin, "'that won't quite do. "'We know how interested you are in the book. "'We are so grateful for the least little hint.' simpered mrs featherstone and it is so useful to know how a scene strikes just the ordinary observer you know so if you did notice anything don't please be afraid to mention it vincent had told himself that in going there he would be able to put away all personal association with the play he had given the book up once and for all he only desired to see mabel once as his lost heroine but nature had proved too strong for him after all the feebleness of this dramatic version had vexed his instincts as creator more than he was willing to believe and when in this very closing scene the strongest situation in the book had been ruined by the long and highly unnecessary tirade which had been assigned to the hero vincent's philosophy had been severely shaken and so at this some impulse too strong for all other considerations possessed him to do what he could to remove that particular blemish at least it was not wise but it was absolutely disinterested he suggested that a shorter and simpler sentence at the critical moment might prove more effective than a long set speech mrs featherstone smiled an annoyed little smile you don't quite understand the point she said there was no question about the text i had no idea of altering that we are merely in doubt as to the various positions at the fall of the curtain i'm afraid i've no suggestions to make then said vincent not without some inward heat oh but put in caffyn and his lip curled with malicious enjoyment give us an idea of the short simple sentence you would substitute it's easy enough to make a general criticism of that sort yes indeed said mrs featherstone that is only fair mr holroyd if he had been cooler he might have resisted what was obviously a challenge from the enemy but just then he had lost some of his usual self-control something of this kind he said and gave the line he had originally written now that is very funny said mrs featherstone icily really why do you know my dear mr holroyd that the speech you find such fault with happens to be just the one i took entire from the book itself and it was in fact one of mark's improvements vincent then saw for the first time that mabel had joined the group and he was angry with himself for his folly where has ashburn got to we must tell him that said caffyn that distinguished man has been keeping out of the way all the evening there he is over there in the corner and he gave him a sign that he was wanted no one had seen mark for some little time and he had interfered very little during the rehearsal now as he came towards them he looked shaken and ill my dear fellow said caffyn this presumptuous man here has been suggesting that your immortal dialogue wants cutting badly crush him he has every right to his opinion said mark with an effort Ah said caffyn with a keen appreciation of the situation but just explain your views to him holroyd he may think there's something in them it is a pity said mabel that mark's book should have been without the advantage of mr holroyd's assistance so long she was the more angry with vincent because she felt that he was right i don't think i quite deserved that said vincent sadly if my opinion had not been asked i should not have ventured to criticise and now that i know that i have the book against me of course i have nothing more to say you seemed to have misunderstood me a little he added looking straight at caffyn if you can give me a minute i could easily explain all i meant caffyn understood in private i suppose he suggested softly as he drew vincent a little aside i thought as much said caffyn as the other assented they're going to dance here come up on the stage it's clear now and the rags down 
he led the way up the wooden steps by the proscenium pushed aside the gold and crimson hangings and they were in comparative darkness and absolute privacy immediately now began vincent you had some object in saying what you did down there what was it caffin had seated himself on the edge of a table which had been rolled into a corner with some other stage furniture he smiled with much sweetness as he replied i say you know we'd better come to the point i know all about it only the pressing need of discovering the full extent of the other's information kept vincent from some outburst what do you know he demanded well said caffin i know that you are the real pig so to speak and that miserable humbug ashburn's only the squeak you mean you think you know that what is your authority now protested caffin in a tone of injury do you think i should venture on a bold statement like that without anything to back my opinion and if ashburn and i both deny your bold statement what becomes of it ashburn has not denied it and if he did i could put my hand on some written evidence which would go a long way to settle the question i should like to see your evidence said vincent i was sure you would said caffin but i don't happen to have it here in fact the papers which contain it are in the charge of a very dear friend of mine who chanced to discover them vincent did not believe him perhaps you can describe them he asked quickly aha said caffin i've made you sit up as they say across the water oh i'll give you every information those papers are of interest to the collector of literary curiosities as being beyond a doubt the original rough draft of that remarkable work illusion then better known as let me see was it glowworms no something like it glamour they were found in your late rooms and one needn't be an expert to recognize that peculiar fist of yours are you satisfied vincent had not expected this having fancied that his loose papers had all been destroyed as he had certainly intended them to be on leaving england he was silent for some seconds then he said you must get those papers for me they are mine but my dear fellow argued caffin what earthly use can they be to you what business is that of yours retorted vincent i want them i mean to have them you won't do any good by taking that tone with me you know just listen to reason if you produce these papers yourself you'll only be laughed at for your pains you must let someone else manage the business for you you can't smash ashburn alone you can't indeed and who told you said vincent that i want to smash ashburn for heaven's sake don't you turn hypocrite drawled caffin you can speak out now if you've got anything inside you but sawdust of course you want to smash ashburn i saw your game long ago did you said vincent who began to have the greatest difficulty in keeping his temper and what was my game why explained caffin you knew well enough that if you set up a claim like that on your mere word you wouldn't find many to believe you and you didn't feel up to such a fight as you would have before you so you've very prudently been lying low till you could get master mark off his guard or till something turned up to help you now's your time i'll help you then once more get me those papers said vincent to think observed caffin with pity that the man who could write illusion should be so dense don't i tell you you must keep in the background you leave it all to me there's a literary fellow i know who's on lots of journals that like nothing better than taking up cases like yours when they're satisfied there's something in them i can manage all that for you and in a few days look out for an article that will do ashburn's business for him you needn't be afraid of his fighting he'll never have the nerve to bring a libel action but you can't work this yourself in your hands all that evidence is waste paper it's the date and manner of its discovery which must be proved to make it of any value and that's where i come in i need scarcely tell you perhaps that i don't propose to mix myself up in all this unless there is some better understanding between us in the future 
"'You had better be quite plain,' said Vincent. "'What is your proposal?' "'There has been a little unpleasantness about a letter which little Dolly Langton and I accidentally—' "'I know the facts, thank you,' interrupted Vincent. "'That makes it easier.' continued the other unabashed though you've probably been told the highly coloured version i've been told that you bullied that poor child into burning a letter of mine which you hadn't the courage to suppress for yourself said vincent ah that is the highly coloured version said caffyn but for the purpose of the present case we'll assume it to be correct if you like well we can't possibly work together if you won't make up your mind to let bygones be bygones you understand i think i do said vincent provided i forget that a letter of mine was intercepted and destroyed unread by a cowardly cold-blooded trick which if it was not actually a felony came very near it provided i forget all that and treat you as an intimate friend of mine i shall have your support coarsely put said caffyn but you seem to have got hold of the main point and if i decline said vincent what then why then returned caffyn placidly i am afraid that my friend in whose custody the papers are and who really is as casual a person as i ever met may mislay those documents or go off somewhere without leaving his address which would make things awkward vincent could stand no more the anger he had suppressed for some time broke out at last if you dare to make me an offer like that in any other place than a friend's house if you even try to speak to me when we next meet you will be unpleasantly surprised at your reception do you think any help you could give me would be worth the disgrace of having you for a friend if i am asked my opinion of you i shall give it and it will not be one you would care to quote as for the papers tell your friend you will not have to go very far to find him tell him he may do what he pleases with them mislay them suppress them burn them as he likes perhaps he will be doing me a greater service than he imagines he was afraid that he might have betrayed his real feelings in the matter but caffyn was too much a man of the world to believe him he only thought that the other either had independent means of proving his claim when he chose or felt convinced that it would be proved for him without the necessity of committing himself to any alliance or compromise he could not help admiring such strategy even while it disappointed him you're devilish deep after all he said slowly a little overdone that last bit perhaps but no matter i can read between the lines and now as i am due for this first dance and they seem to be striking up down there i'll ask you to excuse me one word if you want me to play your little game don't interfere with mine you know what i mean vincent made no answer and caffyn went down to the music-room again where about a dozen couples were already dancing it was a small and quite informal affair but one or two people had come in from other houses and the room was filled without the hopeless crush which it would have contained on an ordinary occasion he avoided gilda whose eyes however were following him watchfully and made his way to where mabel was sitting looking on at the dancing for she had declined to take a more active part and was intending to make her escape as soon as mark should come to rescue her i'll try one more chance he thought and if that fails vincent had satisfied himself as he passed through the room after caffyn had left him that mark was not there he went through a network of rooms and out on the staircase looking for him mark had had much to endure in the way of enthusiastic comments on his own work and the delight he was supposed to feel at his wife's rendering of his heroine while mrs featherstone had driven him almost frantic by her persistent appeals confidences and suggestions with regard to the performance he had chosen a moment when her attention was distracted to slip out unobserved he knew he must return soon but his nerves would bear no more just then and wandering aimlessly from room to room he came to one in which some light refreshments had been placed for those engaged in the rehearsal and he filled a small tumbler of champagne from a half-empty bottle he found there and drank it hoping it would give him courage to go back and play his part to the end 
As he put down the glass, Vincent came in. "'I was looking for you,' the latter began hurriedly, when he had satisfied himself that they were not likely to be overheard. "'I have seen Caffin.' "'Well,' said Mark listlessly, "'it is worse than I thought,' was the answer. "'He has got hold of some papers. Heaven knows how, but he can prove his case. He half threatened to destroy them, but if I know him, he won't. He will use them to keep his hold over you. We must get the start of him. Yes, agreed Mark. I can disappoint him there, at all events. I'll go to Fladgate tomorrow and tell him everything. It's all I can do now, and the sooner it is over, the better. You must do nothing without me, said Vincent. Despair made Mark obstinate. I wish to God I had spoken out last Easter. You stopped me then. You shall not stop me this time. I'll keep that book no longer, whatever the consequences may be. Listen to me, said Vincent. I will take back the book. I see no other course now. But I claim the right to tell the story myself, and in my own way. You will not be madman enough to contradict me? Mark laughed bitterly. If you can tell that story so as to make it look any better, or any worse than it is, I won't contradict you, he said. That is a safe promise. Remember it, then, said Vincent. I will tell you more when I have thought things out a little. In the meantime, the less we see of that scoundrel, the better. Can't you take Mabel home now? Yes, said Mark. We will go home, and... And you'll come tomorrow? Tomorrow, said Vincent. Tell her nothing till you have seen me. They were returning to the music-room when Mrs. Featherstone passed. "'Have you seen Mr. Caffin?' she asked Mark. "'I want to talk to him about the alterations in the fourth act.' "'He went to sit out one of the dances with Mabel,' Gilda said. "'But I sent her to look for them, and she hasn't come back yet. "'I think they must have gone through the gold room and out on the balcony. "'It's cooler there.' When she had passed on out of hearing, Mark turned to Vincent. "'Did you hear that?' he said. "'Mabel is out there, with him. "'We are saved the trouble of telling her anything now. "'That devil means to tell her himself. "'I can't stay here. "'Tell me where you are going. "'For God's sake, don't do anything rash,' cried Vincent. "'You may be wrong.' "'He caught him by the arm as he spoke. "'Let me go,' said Mark, wrenching himself free. "'Vincent would have accompanied him, "'but the excitement had turned him suddenly faint and dizzy.' and he found himself obliged to remain where he was, until the attack passed and left him able to move and think once more. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of The Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 39 Caffin Springs His Mine "'I should like your opinion about those hangings in the gold-room,' Caffin had said to Mabel, for the benefit of any bystanders, as soon as he reached her chair. "'They seem to me the very thing for the boudoir scene in the third act. You promised to help me. Would it bore you very much to come now?' Tired as she was, Mabel made no demur. She knew, of course, that he wished to speak to her alone, and she had something to say to him herself, which could not be said too soon. He led her through the room in question, a luxurious little nest at an angle of the house, entered by separate doors from the music-room and the head of the principal staircase. But he did not think it necessary to waste any time upon the hangings, and they passed out through one of the two windows upon the balcony, which had been covered in with striped canvas for the season. He drew forward a seat for her and took one himself, but did not speak for some time. He was apparently waiting for her to begin. A tete-a-tete -tete with a man to whom one has just forbidden one's house is necessarily a delicate matter, and although Mabel did not falter at all in her purpose, she did feel a certain nervousness which made her unwilling to speak at first. "'As you leave me to begin,' he said, "'let me ask you if what your husband has told me just now is true, that you have closed your own door to me and mean to induce Mrs. Langton to do the same.' "'It is true,' she replied in a low voice. "'You left me no other course.' "'You know what the result of that will be, I suppose,' he continued. 
mrs featherstone will soon find out that two such intimate friends of hers will have nothing to do with me and she will naturally want to know the reason what shall you tell her that is what i meant to say to you she answered i thought i ought in fairness to tell you that you might perhaps take it as a warning if i am asked though i hope i shall not be i shall feel bound to say what i know do you think i can't see what you are aiming at in all this he asked and under his smooth tones there were indications of coming rage you have set yourself to drive me out of this house all i wish said mabel is to prevent you as far as i can from ever tormenting dolly again i am determined to do that you know as well as i do that you will do much more than that mrs featherstone does not love me as it is your conduct will give her the excuse she wants to get rid of me i can't help it she said firmly and if gilda is brought to see before it is too late what things you are capable of it would be the best thing that could happen for her it would be more straightforward wouldn't it if you told her at once he suggested with a slight sneer it comes to very much the same thing in the end mabel had had some searchings of conscience on this very point ought she she had asked herself knowing what she knew of caffyn's past to stand by while a girl whom she liked as she did gilda deceived herself so grossly but of late a coldness had sprung up between gilda and herself which made it unlikely that any interference would be taken in good part and besides there was something invidious in such a course to which she could not bring herself without feeling more certain than she did that it was necessary and would be of any avail if i was sure i should do the least good i should certainly tell her mabel replied but i hope now that it will not be necessary he bit his lips you are exceedingly amiable i must say he observed but really now why all this bitterness what makes you so anxious to see an obscure individual like myself jilted and ruined am i bitter said mabel i don't think so you ought to know that i do not wish for your ruin but i can't help wishing that this marriage should be broken off ah he said softly and may i ask why why cried mabel can you ask because you are utterly unworthy of any nice and good girl you will make your wife a very miserable woman harold and you are marrying gilda for money and position not love you don't know what love means that is why even in the half-light which came from the shaded lamps in the room within she looked very lovely in her indignation and he hated her the more for it it was maddening to feel that he was absolutely despicable and repulsive in the eyes of this woman to whose fairness even hatred itself could not blind him you are unjust he said bending towards her you forget i loved you i expected that he added for she had turned impatiently away it always does rouse some women's contempt to be told of a love they don't feel in return but i did love you as i suppose i never shall love again as for gilda i don't mind confessing that on my side at all events there is no very passionate emotion she is handsome enough in her peculiar style but then it doesn't happen to appeal to me still she will bring me money and position and she does me the honour if i may say so without vanity of caring very decidedly for me it is fair enough on both sides what right have you what right has any one in the world to interfere and make mischief between us none perhaps i don't know she said but i have told you that i shall not interfere all i am quite sure of is that i am right to protect dolly and if i am asked to speak the truth for gilda's sake and i mean to do it i have told you already what that will end in he said mabel you can't really be so relentless i ask you once more to have some consideration for me we were old playmates together once there was a time when we were almost lovers you did not always hate me like this you might remember that now if i were to promise not to go near dolly i trusted you once before she said you know how you repaid it i will make no more terms besides even if i were silent there are others who know none who would not be silent if you wished it urged caffyn eagerly 
give me one more chance mabel you have had my answer i shall not change it she said now take me back please we have been here long enough caffyn had been anxious from motives of pure economy to try fair means first before resorting to extreme measures he had tried irony argument flattery and sentiment and all in vain it was time for his last coup he motioned her to remain as she half rose not yet he said i have something to say to you first and you must hear it you have driven me to it remember that when i have finished she sank back again half quelled by the power she felt in the man from the streets below came up the constant roll of wheels and clip-clop of hoofs from passing broughams intermingled now and then with shouts and shrill whistles telling of early departures from sundry awning-covered porticos around from the music-room within came the sound of waltz music only slightly muffled by doors and hangings they were playing my queen though she was not conscious of hearing it at the time in after time however when that waltz with the refrain part dreamy part passionate which even battered brass and iron hammers cannot render quite commonplace became popular with street bands and piano organs it was always associated for her with a vague sensation of coming evil caffyn had risen and stood looking down upon her with a malignant triumph which made her shudder even then do you remember he said very clearly and slowly once when you had done your best to humiliate me that i told you i hoped for your sake i should never have a chance of turning the tables he paused while she looked up at him with her eyebrows drawn and her lips slightly parted i think my chance has come he continued seeing that she did not mean to answer really i do when i have told you what i am going to tell you all that pretty disdain and superiority of yours will vanish like smoke and in a minute or two you will be begging my silence at any price and you shall accept my terms i do not think so said mabel bravely only her own curiosity and the suggestion of some hidden power in the other's manner kept her from refusing to remain there any longer i do said caffyn ah mabel you are a happy woman with a husband who is the ideal of genius and goodness and good looks what will you say i wonder when i tell you that you owe all this happiness to me it's true i watched the growth of your affection with the deepest interest and at the critical moment when an unexpected obstacle to your union turned up it was i who removed it at considerable personal sacrifice aren't you grateful well between ourselves i could scarcely expect gratitude i-i don't understand she said i am going to explain he rejoined you have been pitying poor gilda for throwing herself away on a worthless wretch like me keep your pity you will want it yourself perhaps do you understand now i let you marry mark because i could think of no revenge so lasting and so perfect she rose quickly i have heard enough she said you must be mad to dare to talk like this let me go you hurt me he had caught her arm above her long glove and held it tight for a moment while he bent his face down close to hers and looked into her eyes with a cruel light in his own you shall not go till you have heard me out he said between his teeth you have married a common impostor an imprudent swindler do you understand i knew it long ago i could have exposed him fifty times if i had chosen a few lines from me to the proper quarter and the whole story would be public property to-morrow as fine a scandal as literary london has had for ages and by heaven mabel if you don't treat me decently i'll speak out i see you can't take my word for all this perhaps you will take your husband's ask him if his past has no secrets there should be none between you now you know ask him he would have said more but she freed herself suddenly from his grasp and turned on him from the window you coward she cried scornfully 
I am not Dolly. You cannot frighten me. He was not prepared for this, having counted upon an instant surrender which would enable him to dictate his own terms. I don't want to frighten you, he said sulkily. I only want you to see that I don't mean to be trifled with. He had followed her to the window, meaning to induce her to return, but all at once he stepped back hastily. There's someone coming, he said in a rapid undertone. It's Mrs. Featherstone. Mabel, you won't be mad enough to tell her. You shall see, said Mabel, and the next moment she had taken refuge by the side of her hostess, her eyes bright and her cheeks flushed with anger. Mrs. Featherstone, she said, almost clinging to her in her excitement, let me go back with you anywhere I should be safe from that man. Caffin was no longer visible, having retired to the balcony, so that the elder lady was somewhat bewildered by this appeal, especially as she did not quite catch it. "'Of course you shall go back with me if you want to,' she said. "'But are you all alone here? I thought I should find Mr. Caffin. Where is he?' "'There, on the balcony,' said Mabel. "'It is no wonder that he is ashamed to show himself.' At this Caffin judged it advisable to appear. "'I don't exactly know why I should be afraid,' he said, with a rather awkward ease. "'Are you going to publish our little quarrel, Mrs. Ashburn? Is it worth while, do you think?' "'It was no quarrel,' retorted Mabel. "'Will you tell Mrs. Featherstone what you dared to say to me, or must I?' Mrs. Featherstone looked from one to the other with growing uneasiness. It would be very awkward to have any unpleasantness in her little company when the play was so far advanced. On the other hand, she was not disposed to suffer matters for a man she disliked so heartily as Harold Caffin. "'Mabel, dearest, tell me what it is all about,' she said. "'If he has insulted you, he shall answer to me for it.' "'He insulted my husband,' said Mabel. "'I will speak, Harold. I am not afraid, though I know you have every reason to wish your words forgotten. He said—' Here Caffin interrupted her. He had made up his mind the only thing he could do with his secret now was to use it to spike the enemy's guns. Mabel was rash enough to insist on an explanation. She should have it. "'One moment,' he said. "'If you still insist on it, I will repeat what I said presently.' "'I was trying to prepare Mrs. Ashburn for a very painful disclosure,' he explained to Mrs. Featherstone, "'a disclosure which, considering my position in the family, I felt it would be my duty to make before long. I could not possibly foresee that she would take it like this. If you think a little, Mrs. Ashburn, I am sure you will see that this is not the time or place for a very delicate and unpleasant business.' "'He pretends that Mark is an impostor, that he knows some secret of his.' mabel broke in vehemently he did not speak of it as he tries to make you believe he threatened me dear mr ashburn whom we all know so well an impostor with a secret you said that to mabel cried mrs featherstone why you must be mad to talk in that dreadful way quite mad my dear mrs featherstone i assure you i'm perfectly sane he replied the real truth is that the world has been grossly deceived all this time no one more so than yourself but i do beg you not to force me to speak here where we might be interrupted at any moment and besides in ordinary consideration to mrs ashburn you did not consider me very much just now she broke in i have told you that i am not afraid to hear you cannot get out of it in that way mabel was well enough aware that mark was not flawless but the idea that he could be capable of a dishonourable action was grotesque and monstrous to her and the only way she could find to punish the man who could conceive such a charge was to force him to declare it openly mrs featherstone's curiosity and alarm had been strongly roused she had taken up this young novelist her name was publicly connected with his if there was anything wrong about him ought she not to know it my love she said to mabel taking her hands you know i don't believe a word of all this it is some strange mistake i am sure of it but it ought perhaps to be cleared up if i were to speak to mr caffin alone now i shall be very willing said caffin no said mabel eagerly if he has anything to say let him say it here 
Mark must not be stabbed in the dark. It's simply impossible to speak here, said Caffyn. People may come in at any moment through those doors as soon as this waltz is over. Mrs. Featherstone will not thank either of us for making a scene. The doors can be locked, cried Mabel. There need be no scene. May they be locked, dear Mrs. Featherstone? He has said too much to be silent any longer. He must speak now. Caffin stepped lightly to the doors which opened into the music room. The key was on his side, and he turned it. The last notes of my queen were sounding as he did so. They could hear the sweep and rustle of dresses as the couples passed. "'We shall not be disturbed now,' he said, unable to quite conceal his own inclinations. "'They are not likely to come in from the staircase. "'If Mrs. Featherstone really insists on my speaking, I can't refuse.' "'Must I, Mabel?' asked the elderly lady, nervously. But Mabel had turned towards the door leading to the staircase, which had just opened. "'Here is Mark to answer for himself,' she cried, as she went to meet him. "'Now, Harold, whatever you have to say against Mark, say it to his face.' Mark's entrance was not so opportune as it seemed. He had been standing unnoticed at the door for some time, waiting until he could wait no longer. He faced Caffin now, unflinchingly enough to outward appearance, but the hand Mabel held in a soft, close clasp was strangely cold and unresponsive. Caffin could not have wished for a better opportunity. "'I assure you this is very painful to me,' he said. "'But you see I cannot help myself. I must ask Mr. Ashburn first if it is not true that this book, Illusion, which has rendered him so famous is not his book at all that from beginning to end it was written by another is he bold enough to deny it mark made no answer mabel had almost laughed to hear so preposterous a question it was not wonderful that he should scorn to reply suddenly she looked at his face and her heart sickened many incidents that she had attached no importance to at the time came back to her now laden with vague but terrible significance she would not doubt him only why did he look as if it was true dear mr ashburn said mrs featherstone we know what your answer will be but i think i'm afraid you ought to say something he turned his ghastly face and haggard eyes to her and at the same instant withdrew his hand from mabel's what would you have me say he asked hoarsely i can't deny it it is not my book from beginning to end it was written by another and as he spoke the words vincent holroyd entered the room his recent attack of faintness had left him so weak that for some time he was obliged to remain in a little alcove on the staircase and rest himself on one of the divans there his head was perfectly clear however and he had already perfected a plan by which mabel would be spared the worst of that which threatened her it was simple and as far as he could see quite impossible to disprove he would let it be understood that mark and he had written the book in collaboration and that he had desired his own share of the work to be kept secret mark could not refuse for mabel's sake to second him in this statement it was actually true even for as vincent thought with a grim kind of humour there was a good deal of mark's work in the book as it stood now he grew feverishly impatient to see mark and put his plan into action there must be time yet caffin could not have been such a villain as to open mabel's eyes to the real case he felt strong again now he would go and assure himself this was so he rose and following the direction he had seen mark take entered the gold room only to hear an admission after which no defence seemed possible he stood there just behind mark trying to take in what had happened there was mrs featherstone struggling to conceal her chagrin and dismay at the sudden downfall of her dramatic ambition mark standing apart with bent head and hands behind him like a man facing a firing party mabel struck speechless and motionless by the shock and caffin with the air of one who has fulfilled an unpalatable duty vincent knew it all now he had come too late mrs featherstone made a movement towards him oh mr holroyd she said with a very strained smile 
you mustn't come in please we're we're talking over our little play state secrets you know caffyn's smile meant mischief as he said mr holroyd has every right to be here my dear mrs featherstone as you'll allow when i tell you who he is he has too much diffidence to assert himself mr ashburn has admitted that he did not write illusion he might have added that he stole the book in a very treacherous and disgraceful way i am sorry to use words of this sort but when you know all you will understand that i have some excuse mr holroyd can tell you the story better than i can he is a man who has been wronged the real author of illusion i've done him a good turn there he thought he can't very well turn against me after that a terrible silence followed his words vincent's brain whirled he could think of nothing mabel was the first to move or speak she went to mark's side as he stood silent and alone before his accuser and touched his arm mark she said in an agonized whisper do you hear tell them it is not true oh i can't believe it i won't only speak vincent's heart swelled with a passionate devotion for her as she raised her fair face blanched and stricken with an agony of doubt and hope to her husband's averted eyes how she loved him what would he not have given for love like that his own feelings were too true and loyal however to wish even for a moment to see the love and faith die out of her face slain for ever by some shameful confession was it too late to save her even now his brain cleared suddenly a way of escape had opened to him in the meantime two newcomers had entered mr featherstone hearing voices had brought up mr langton who had looked in on his way from the house and for some time remained under the impression that they had interrupted some kind of informal rehearsal still at the theatricals eh he observed as he came in go on don't let us disturb you capital capital langton whispered the other pulling him back they're they're not acting i'm afraid something's the matter and the two waited to gather some idea of what was happening before mark could reply if he meant to reply to mabel's appeal vincent had anticipated him mrs ashburn mabel he said you are right to trust in his honour it is not true i can explain everything the instant joy and relief in her face as she clung fondly to mark's arm repaid him and gave him strength and courage to go on mark looked round with a stunned wonder what could be said or done to save him now he thought vincent was mad to try but the latter put his hand as if affectionately on his shoulders with a warning pressure and he said nothing do you mean said caffyn to holroyd with an angry sneer that i told a lie that you did not write illusion that was not the lie returned vincent i did write illusion it is untrue that mr ashburn's conduct in the matter does him anything but credit may i tell my story here mrs featherstone oh by all means said that lady not too graciously we can't know the facts too soon i wrote the book said vincent before i went out to ceylon i was at the bar then and had thoughts of practising again at some future time i had a fancy which was foolish i dare say to keep the fact that i had written a novel as close secret so i entrusted the manuscript to my good friend mr ashburn leaving him to arrange if he could for its publication and i charged him to keep my secret by every means in his power in fact i was so much in earnest about it that i made him give me his solemn promise that if he could not shield me in any other way he would do so with his own name i did not really believe then that it would be necessary or even that the book would be accepted but i knew mr ashburn wrote novels himself and i hoped the arrangement would not do him any actual harm till then he had gone on fluently enough it was merely a modification of his original idea with a considerable blending of the actual facts but he felt that there were difficulties to come which it would require all his skill to avoid i was detained as you know for more than a year in ceylon and unable most of the time to write to england he continued when i came home i found i was told that the book had obtained a success neither of us had ever dreamed of 
curiosity had been aroused and mr ashburn had found himself driven to keep his promise he he was anxious that i should release him and clear the matter up i i it was not convenient for me to do so just then and i and i induced him he could hardly refuse perhaps to keep up the disguise a little longer we had just arranged to make everything known shortly when mr caffin anticipated us and that is really all there is to tell about that throughout vincent's explanation caffin had been inwardly raging at the thought that his victims might actually succeed in escaping after all forcing an indulgent laugh he said my dear fellow it's very kind and generous of you to say all that and it sounds very pretty and almost probable but you can't expect us seriously to believe it you know for an instant this remark appeared to produce a reaction but it vanished at vincent's reply his pale warm face flushed angrily as he faced him no one seriously expects you to believe in such things as honour and friendship he said contemptuously i am going to deal with your share in this now mrs featherstone he added will you forgive me if i am obliged to pain you by anything i may have to say that man has thought fit to bring a disgraceful charge against my friend here it is only right that you should know how little he deserves credit secretly mrs featherstone was only too glad to see caffin discomfited but all she did was to say stiffly oh pray don't consider my feelings mr holroyd vincent's indignation was enough in itself to make him merciless and then as a matter of policy he was determined to disable the enemy to the utmost everything that had come to his knowledge of caffin's proceedings he now exposed with biting irony he told the story of the letter suppressed to all appearances out of gratuitous malice and of the cruel terrorism exercised over little dolly he showed how caffin had tried to profit by his supposed discovery of the fraud and how mark had studiously refrained from undeceiving him and gave a damaging description of the sordid threats and proposals he had himself received that evening this is the high-minded gentleman who acting under a keen sense of duty has chosen to denounce mr ashburn just now he concluded the victory was won caffin's face was livid as he heard him he had never foreseen such black ingratitude as this and it upset all his calculations he still had his doubts after so many careful experiments that the story of vincent's was a fabrication even though it was not absolutely inconsistent with what he had observed and he could see no motive for shielding the culprit but it was plain that every one there believed it vincent's word would be taken before his he was thoroughly beaten no one had seen gilda come in but she had been standing for some time with red eyes and flushed face by one of the windows and in the general stir which followed vincent's explanation mr featherstone came up to her well he said we've been treated to a very pretty story this evening this is the young gentleman you're going to give me for a son-in-law is it gilda but of course you don't believe a word against him i believe it all and more she said with a passionate sob caffin turned to her you too gilda he cried pathetically you might have deceived me even after this she said only mamma sent me to go and fetch you i heard you out there on the balcony talking to mabel and and i went out by the other window this one and along the balcony to the corner and in point of fact you listened he said yes i did she retorted and i shall be glad of it all my life i heard enough to save me from you she left him there and flew to mabel whom she embraced with a remorseful hug you darling she whispered what a wicked fool i was ever to be jealous of you and about him you will forgive me won't you and i am so glad about poor dear mr ashburn mr featherstone tapped caffin lightly on the shoulder well master harold he said have you got anything to say with all this suppressing and plotting and bullying and threatening and the rest of it it strikes me you have made a deep fool of yourself the same idea had already occurred to caffin he had been admirably cool and cautious he had devoted all his energies to securing mabel's marriage to mark he had watched and waited and sprung his mine with every precaution 
and he was the only person it had blown up. His schemes had failed exactly like a common fool's, which was painful to reflect upon. "'If I haven't,' he said with a slight grimace, "'I've been made to look very like one.' "'You're more rogue than fool, after all,' observed the merchant with distressing candour. "'And, by the way, I'm rather particular about getting all my correspondence, "'and I invariably prefer to burn my own letters. "'I don't think my offices are quite the place for such a gifted young fellow as you seem to be.' "'You mean I'm to go?' said Caffin. "'I do,' was the reply. "'I never will have anyone about me I can't trust. "'I did think once, but that's over. "'You heard what my girl said to you. "'We'd better part now. "'I won't deny I'm sorry.' "'Not sorrier than I am, I'll swear,' said Caffin, with a short laugh. "'Good-bye, Mrs. Featherstone,' he added to that lady who stood by. "'You're not sorry, are you?' Gilda will be a duchess after all, now. And he left the house, feeling as he passed out that the very footman by the entrance knew of his discomfiture. And carrying away with him for a lasting recollection, Mabel's look of radiant happiness as she heard Mark so completely vindicated. Revenge is sweet, he thought bitterly, but I kept mine too long, and it's turned devilish sour. Well, my dear, said Mr. Featherstone to his wife, "'You've been leaving your other young people to their own devices all this time. "'Wouldn't it be as well to go and look after them?' "'The dancing had been going on in the adjoining room while all this was taking place. "'Now and then the doors had been tried by couples in search of a cool retreat between the waltzes, "'but no one suspected what important revelations were being made within. "'Mrs. Featherstone was deeply mortified. "'It was true she had got rid of a hated presence, but her play— which she had meant to make the closing event of the season, and by which she had hoped to conquer one or two of the remaining rungs of the social ladder, her play was rendered impossible. This affair would get into the society papers, with every perversion which wit or malice could supply. She would be made thoroughly ridiculous. "'I'll go,' she said. "'I must get rid of everybody as soon as I decently can. This shocking business has completely upset me.' Mark and Vincent were standing together at the door, and as she passed out she visited some of her pent-up displeasure upon them. "'Well, Mr. Ashburn and Mr. Holroyd,' she said in tones that were intended to sound playful, "'I hope you are quite contented with your little mystification. Such a very original idea on both your parts, really. How it must have amused you both to see me making such an absurd exhibition of myself all this time. Seriously, though, I do consider I have been very, very shabbily treated.' "'You might have warned me as a friend, Mr. Ashburn, without betraying any one's confidence. "'No, don't explain, either of you. I could not bear any more explanations just now.' "'Mr. Langton, as he followed her, took Mark out with him, and as soon as they were alone gave full vent to his own indignation. "'I don't understand your conceptions of honour," he said. "'Whatever your duty might be to Vincent, you clearly had duties towards my daughter and myself. "'Do you suppose I should have given her to you if I had known? "'It just comes to this, and no sophistry can get over it. "'You obtained my consent under false pretenses.' "'For he was naturally intensely humiliated by the difference these disclosures must make "'in his daughter's position, and did not spare his son-in-law.' He said much more to the same effect, and Mark bore it all without attempting a defence. He still felt a little stunned by the danger he had passed through, and after all, he thought, what he had heard now was nothing to what might have been said to him. Obeying a glance from Mabel, as the others followed Mrs. Featherstone back to the music-room, Vincent had remained behind. "'When will you allow this to be generally known?' she asked, and her voice had a strange new coldness which struck him with terror. Had she seen through this device? Was it all useless? As soon as possible, he answered gently. We shall see the publishers tomorrow, and then all the details will be arranged. And your triumph will come, she said bitterly. I hope you will be able to enjoy it. Mabel, he said earnestly, Harold Caffin forced me to speak tonight. Surely you saw that. I, I did not intend to claim the book yet. "'Why didn't you claim it long ago?' she demanded. "'Why must you put this burden on Mark at all? "'Surely your secret could have been kept without that. 
but you came home and knew what a success marks your book i beg your pardon it is strange at first you know what a success your book had been and how hard it was making his life for him he begged you then you said to take back his promise and you you would not oh it was selfish vincent cruelly selfish of you his sole concern in making that hasty explanation had been to give it an air of reasonable probability he had never given a thought till that moment of the light in which he was presenting his own conduct now in one terrible instant it rushed upon him with an overwhelming force i i acted for the best he said and even to himself the words sounded like a sullen apology for your best she said the book will be talked of more than ever now but did you never think of the false position in which you were placing mark what will become of him after this people might have read his books once they will never read them now they may even say that that harold caffyn may have been right and all that is your work vincent he groaned within him at his helplessness he stood before her with bowed head not daring to raise his eyes lest he should be tempted to undo all his work i was proud of mark she continued because i thought he had written illusion i am prouder now it is better to be loyal and true as mark has been than to write the noblest book and sacrifice a friend to it there are better things than fame vincent even his devotion was not proof against this last injustice he raised his head and anger burnt in his eyes you tell me that he cried passionately as if i had ever cared for fame in itself mabel you have no right to say these things to me do you hear no right have some charity try and believe that there may be excuses even for me that if you could know my motives you might feel you had been unjust is there anything i don't know she asked somewhat moved by this outburst anything you have kept from me no you have heard all i have to say all there is to tell he admitted then i am not unjust she said but if you feel justified in acting as you have done so much the better for you and we shall do no good by talking any more about it none whatever he agreed when he was alone that night he laughed fiercely to himself at the manner in which his act of devotion had been accepted all his sacrifices had ended in making mabel despise him for calculating selfishness he had lost her esteem for ever if he had foreseen this he might have hesitated deep and unselfish as his love was but it was done and he had saved her better he tried to think that she should despise him than lose her belief in her husband and with it all that made life fair to her but altruism of this kind is a cold and barren consolation men do good by stealth now and then men submit to misconstruction but then it is always permitted to them to dream that some day an accident may bring the good or the truth to light this was a hope which by the nature of the case vincent could never entertain and life was greyer to him than ever before End of chapter thirty nine